This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyamagaku University in central Tokyo. This talk is with Rose Henschel, Professor of English and Associate Dean for Academic Programs at Colorado State University. Rose is also the author of a recent book, St. Paul's Cathedral Precinct in Early Modern Literature and Culture, Spatial Practices. This conversation should begin by making it abundantly clear that St. Paul's Cathedral was far different in shape and form during the period that Rose Henschel examines in her book. The current domed cathedral was designed by Christopher Wren and built after the cathedral's destruction by the Great Fire of London in 1666. The cathedral before Wren was shaped much differently and would have looked much like it is depicted here in a recent reconstruction by the virtual St. Paul's Cathedral Project. We encourage our viewers and listeners to visit the virtual St. Paul's Cathedral Project online to see and even experience what the cathedral grounds were like before Wren. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. If you are joining us via a podcast and wish to watch this program, we are available on YouTube under the search term, Speaking of Shakespeare. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University, and also with the generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Good afternoon. It's your afternoon, Rose. It is so good to see you. It really, really is. And uh, how is everything in Colorado right now? Everything's beautiful. It's a beautiful day here in Colorado. It's about 4 p.m. And I'm just really thrilled to have the chance to talk to you today. Well, I'm thrilled. And we can have a competition to see who is more thrilled. Uh, I don't want to waste any time before we get to your new book, because it is new as far as academic books go, extremely new. And the title is St. Paul's Precinct in Early Modern Literature and Culture, Spatial Practices. And I know that you have, through your career, you have been working on, uh, well, gender, of course, and dress, cloth, clothing, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and of course, spatial, what uh, a key word, spatial practices, this added to the title, which is so important for that region. So if you could just kind of bring us up to speed on, on your book and what it's about and what uh, a reader can expect. Well, thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity. I published the book. Um, it came out in July of 2020, really in the middle of the pandemic and um, talk about anticlimactic. Um, it was really um, the, the labor of 10 years, at least, and to have the book come out and not be able to promote it or go to conferences and talk about it or share my, um, you know, the, to those 10 years of labor um, felt a little strange. And, and some days I forget that I actually wrote the book. And so I'm very grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Um, and I, and I, you know, to be honest, I did have to sort of read the book again or take the take a look at the book because um, it, it is kind of faded into the background so um, thanks again for giving me the opportunity I'm really thrilled so the Whoa. book um, is on St. Paul's precinct in um, the late 16th and early 17th century and when first of all I want to pause and define what we mean by precinct um, precinct is essentially um, the area around um, a building or a structure. And in this time period, and specifically with religious buildings, it's the consecrated land or religious inf religiously inflected land um, in and around um, the church or the cathedral proper. So it's not necessarily only about the church itself, but, a, but the space and the uses of the space around the church, um, the churchyard, as it were. And so my the general argument of the book is that we are better able to understand this very thoroughly studied cathedral if we start paying attention to the daily users of the cathedral. Um, and not only the church 
users or those related to the cathedral's religious practices, such as the clergy and the religious um, administration, or even the religious auditors, right? The people who went to go hear sermons or attend services in the, in the parish churches, but really the lay users, the secular users who um, inhabited that space, um, both as a neighborhood, there were homes in the cathedral precinct, there were businesses in the cathedral precinct, there were the books, book shops and the booksellers, and then there were just sort of what we would call today loiterers in the precinct. And I believe that we can really understand or, or nuance our understanding of the cathedral if we better access those stories of the day-to-day the -day users of the precinct, including but beyond the cathedral um, employees. So that's essentially the gist of the book. And in particular, I like to pay attention here and really in all my work to the embodied practices. That's where that title spatial practices comes from of the users of the church. What were they seeing? What were they smelling? What were they feeling? How did they navigate? from you know, the churchyard back into the cathedral? What was it like to have piles of horse manure literally in the nave? Um, how did they manage that? Um, and how did they clean it up? Uh, so those are the stories that really intrigue me. And the title Spatial Practices actually comes from uh, Michel de Certeau's The Practices of Everyday Life, in which he talks about um, all of our stories, our spatial stories, um, and that's really the angle I'm taking on, a, again, a very well studied, a very thoroughly studied space in London. Um, there's, it's hard to imagine having, you know, the, the gumption to write another book on St. Paul's. Um, but I really realized that if I were, was able to kind of get at some of these stories, I would, we would all be able to learn a little bit more. And understanding what source material could look like when we talk about Paul's, not just historical records and archives, but literature and letters and other sorts of things that we don't typically use when we do straight up historical research. That, it's just wonderful. Now, I have to confess, we have not been able to, and it's probably pandemic related. But I have not been able to get a copy. I've been able to read as much as I can from previews online. And, you know, I've, uh, I've been interested in the cathedral for years and have uh, done some research uh, in that area. But I wanted for our listeners and viewers to uh, understand that this is a enormous area inside the walls of the old city of London. And what happened in there, as you were saying, goes, well, everything in London goes in and everything comes back out. And there are direct connections for everybody, archeologists, historians, cultural historians, gender theorists. Uh, and in, in terms of this uh, podcast broadcast, Shakespeareans, there are direct connections between that cathedral, those bookshops, all the gossip and all of the activity and the way those spaces were used, direct relationships between that area and early modern drama. And you know uh, as well, if not better than I, uh, how much influence uh, that, the, well, the, let's start with the bookshops. That's where you went for your raw material if you were a playwright, but I am certain that that's where you went to overhear what people were talking about. What was buzz? What was the buzz? And that's their word, not our word. That's, so uh, I am so appreciative and am so much looking forward to combing through, perusing every word because you took on and I know from experience, this goes into the abyss very quickly. There's a lot of stuff here. And you took on this uh, incredible, this is a Herculean effort to uh, look at the entire cathedral precinct and to have the courage. And I'm sorry, I, this is just true, Rose. People will come after you, you know, from all kinds of directions. If you're wrong on the smallest detail, they're experts out there. And you had the courage to take on this project and to carry it through. And I'm so happy you did. Uh, you're with the uh, St. Paul's 
Cathedral, uh, let's get the title right here, the Virtual St. Paul's Cathedral Project, headed up by John Wall at NC State University. Tell us about that and tell us about what's happening in terms of being able to visualize online the research that you're putting out in print. A wonderful combination there. Yes, I would be very happy to tell you about that. Um, I, first of all, appreciate your, your characterization of my willingness to do this project as bravery um, when some, some would call it chutzpah or, or stupidity. <laughs> um, and I think that that is one of the wonderful things about being a literary scholar, is especially those of us that came up in the um, sort of new historicist period, is that we started to understand that we could do a lot of things um, with, with our methodologies and that we weren't necessarily confined to the realm of literature as amazing as it is. And I certainly do discuss literature in my book, um, but I, I really, I think I bring a literary scholar's um, perspective um, and sensibility to other source material. And, and that does rattle, um, theology scholars and, and, and archeologists. Um, but I think that the emphasis on not trying to supplant anything that we're doing here or make a different claim that's a better claim or, or a, a, a claim that's more right. But you know, the word I used earlier was nuance. And I think that's ultimately what, when we work in, in historical scholarship is the best we can do, right? We'll never get the truth, right? Especially about a building that no longer exists. We can have shreds of truth, um, but we'll never really recapture the truth. We have to be comfortable in living in the realm of um, educated speculation. And that leads me to answer your question about the Saint, virtual St. Saint Paul's Cathedral project. That um, digital humanities project, um, about 10 or 15 years in the making, maybe 15 years it goes back to, was the sort of brainchild of Professor John Wall at North Carolina State um, to bring to life uh, what St. Paul's Cathedral looked and sounded like in the time period. And through um, National Endowment for Humanities grants and a whole lot of faith and passion, uh, he really worked with um, uh, actors, who were uh, able to recreate old pronunciation of sermons, in particular John Dunn sermons. Um, he worked with the archeologists who have worked on Paul's, um, sound technicians, singers, and really brought this sort of collective effort to re-visualize Paul's. And the most important, I would say the cornerstone of this is the data visualization of the cathedral itself based on the best knowledge that we have of what the cathedral looked like through um, a variety of sources. He's done a fly around of the cathedral. So you can actually see the cathedral from a 360 view, from a bird's eye 360 view. Um, very recently, they've created some of the interior spaces with the tombs and the monuments and Earlier work was around the pulpit where the sermons were delivered. And in particular, he did a, a Easter oh, sermon that Lord, John oh, Dunn delivered. And it's an amazing um, rendition of what a sermon might have sounded like from up close, from a hundred yards back, and maybe even another hundred yards beyond that. Um, you have ambient noise like seagulls. We, we are finally reminded that St. Paul's was near a wharf um, next to the river. Um, and there's murmuring of the crowd and it really visualizes and through sound technology, what I would love my book to also do in a sort of a textual way is to bring to life, animate, if you will, the life of the cathedral beyond its um, important status as the seat of the Bishop of London. Well, I, the, the sections that I've read, I've noticed that you're very good at giving us an ambulatory feel, if that's the right way to say it, of walking through the cathedral, which I think is extremely important. And uh, I also wanted to add to what you've just said, that the uh, in terms of the original, uh, trying to bring back the as much as possible the uh, to restore the 
original look and feel and smell and taste and whatever of the cathedral. We, uh, a friend of our uh, series of our program, Ben Crystal, uh, has done the, uh, uh, whose father, David Crystal, is very famous. He and Ben uh, worked uh, some years ago and still are working on original pronunciation. So Ben read the sermons in this soundproof room he described to me that was sort of out of uh, some sort of a science fiction novel where you, you there's no sound at all except him speaking and he delivers the Dunn sermon in original pronunciation. And so it gets that precise. And also looking at uh, Peter Blaney, you know, years ago, the precision with which he designed or gave us a, a look at that at the bookshops as they surround the, the northeast side of the cathedral. And as your book points out, you're getting two very many spaces, two very large ones, one the cathedral nave, Paul's Walk, which was would you say, Rose, it's a center for gossip and news more perhaps than a religious center? Most of the time, it, everything that we've read and have, all the records show that that's where you went if you wanted to catch up on the gossip. And you could get, you could get robbed there pretty quickly, too. Uh, yeah. Uh, and also the uh, churchyard itself with the pulpit. And uh, I'm interested because I'm kind of on before Shakespeare and early Shakespeare, those of us who are Shakespeareans tend to go to the text and to the stage, to the theater. And uh, those people who are in religious studies, theologians tend to go to the cathedral and Reformation uh, theologians to Paul's cross, the outdoor pulpit where uh, Mary Morrissey and other scholars have pointed out just how political these were, how, how, uh, critical they were in the settlement period, the Elizabethan settlement, mm -hmm. but uh, it's hard to show the crossover and how both are uh, public speaking events, very different, the Globe and, uh, you know, up the Shoreditch theaters up north and are very different from Paul's Cross, very different purpose for going, but it's the same kind of ambu uh, ambulatory audi uh, auditory experience and you can hear when Ben gives the sermon or John Dunn gives the sermon, you can, you can, you can imagine how that sound even bounced off the bookshops. And there's this inner relation between print and public event. And I think you've gotten that. Uh, that's a lot. That's a very, very good point about the actual sort of the, the bouncing of the sound waves off of the bookstore. I love that idea. Um, one of the things that I, I really work on in, with the sermon chapter is um, the way in which the sermons themselves are sort of these hybrid texts. And I, I do that by focusing on the topics of some of the Paul's Cross sermons, a sort of genre of the Jeremiah in the, in the Paul's Cross sermons of the sort of, you know, lamenting the sorry state of London and, um, you know, telling everyone that they're sinners and, um, that London's going to be like Jerusalem, and we've got to figure out how to get back on track. And specifically, the sermons at Paul's Cross that um, are taking aim at um, the sinners who are wearing sumptuous, ostentatious clothing. And so unlike um, the high, high subjects that Mary talks about in, in terms of the political, I go low. Um, which is often my my mode is I, I talk about the sermons that are really um, pointing out vicious behavior on the part of the audience. And I talk about the sermons as hybrid texts in that way that they're borrowing quite heavily from satire of the period, both formal satire, formal verse satire, but also the more um, popular prose satire. And the kinds of rhetorical moves that these two texts make are quite similar. Um, there's, uh, you know, someone like Thomas Nash, for example, who's a, a secular writer, writes in the vein of the sermons. Um, it's very um, mm. kind of polemical, invective, religiously informed. Likewise, we have some sermonists <laughs> whose sermons are very colorful in their descriptions of the sin. And it makes you wonder, like, you seem to know a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about those texts as hybrid texts, and I talk about them as um, the point that the, the uh, preachers are making 
is in, actually enabled by the setting of St. Paul's because of the very reasons you've just mentioned of everything else that's going around St. Paul's. The space of the pulpit was not a discrete space. There, were, there wasn't a door to walk into. People were walking in and out of the space. Um, the one painting we have from the time period that I know you're familiar with, Professor Dabbs, is the Gipkin painting. There's somebody on the margins whipping a dog. There are people clearly not listening to the sermon. There's a lot going on in, in that actual image. And so um, the other thing that I think is important is that um, it was just around the corner where most of the bookshops were. Um, but even that, that wasn't a discrete space. Um, the bookshops led to um, one of the, I think, an understudied part of the precinct, which is the College of Minor Canons. Uh, which was a gated area in the churchyard um, where originally it was the College of Minor Canons where those associated with the males associated with the choir lived, the adult males. Um, but after the Reformation, um, they were allowed to marry and have wives and they were allowed to take on lodgers. And this space became hugely problematic because we get all sorts of um, records around the bad behavior that was going on in those in the College of Minor Canons because they were letting in like Catholic recusants and shady women and the vicars themselves were actually quite badly behaved and all this is written up in the um, the uh, bishop's visitation records and so that's a place we typically look for really official type of information. But anyone who's worked on um, the St. Paul's, you know, Peter Blaney and others who have worked on the details go to that to, to really read between the lines. And um, to get back to the point of the, the, um, the hybrid, you know, nature of the sermon space, um, the, one of my main points of the book is that um, we can't view spaces and activities as discrete in this time period. Um, they, we have to understand the way that um, spaces overlapped uh, with each other, constituted mutually this kind of cultural understanding um, of the precinct as a whole, and really informed each other. So the precincts are like the book star, stalls, are like the College of Minor Canons. And, you know, in addition to things like a pissing wall, right, a, a, a public site for urination in the precinct, and gallows, and a pillory, and places of public shaming and execution, um, these are all happening maybe not on the same day, but in the same space. And, and to sort of talk about those activities as um, standalone or discrete, I think does a disservice to the complexity of the space. Mm -hmm. And as you're intonating the theatricality of the space. Yes, yes, yes. And I want to go low also and go into the commercial elements of this be a little bit, uh, I don't know, post Foucaultian, the, uh, the, uh, the I, I'm, in my mind, okay, maybe in my mind only, uh, the, the sermons did, a, did uh, much early on in the Elizabethan period, and even before, but in the Eliz early Elizabethan period, to market religious material that was being sold at those bookshops. And uh, even though preachers, you know, cried out against the uh, theater and that sort of thing, of course they did. They were in direct commercial competition with uh, the theater, but they also were in of course, uh, you know, I think genuine in there that a lot of bad things happened around theater, you know, uh, let's face it. And it was fun in that way, too. But uh, that same marketing kind of technique where you're you're bouncing uh, public uh, proclamation, public uh, performance off of bookshops, uh, almost literally in sound, uh, creates this market. So publishers can go into a venture markets of pleasure reading. And Tottle does it very early, and William Sears does it very early, and they put out what were supposed to be uh, instructive text like, uh, Ob, you know, Ovid and uh, the Metamorphoses or Metamorphoses, a golden, Golden's favorite, uh, a, a famous translation, and uh, and suddenly all of these plays start coming out with these Ovidian stories, and Shakespeare just mm -hmm. follows second, really second generation after these earlier. Uh, playwrights 
and they're following the same kind of line. They're using that cathedral space uh, to, let's just face it, pre-market, um, get people into the theater. Oh, you know the story of Romeo and Juliet from years ago. You know, there were three, we, we have, what, three, almost three, cent, uh, three not centuries, three decades of it. Everybody knows what happens. But here we're going to put it on stage. And, uh, and I think there were preaching events that were the same sorts of things. They created text, people saw the text, talked about them, and then they would go see the preacher. They were sort of celebrity type preachers uh, at Paul's cross. So this is uh, all the sort of same marketing model, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, and my favorite texts from the period um, are, are the secular authors like Thomas Decker, who um, satirize, and there's many, many satirists of St. Paul's, um, I would call them affectionate satires, because, um, of course, they're poking fun at the people who, as you said, gossiped and were the newsmongers and, and went maybe do a, to go see a sermon, but they're not really there to be, you know, devout. Um, and, of course, then they published these books um, yeah. of satire in, in, the, in the churchyard. So it yeah. is really a, a recursive um, cycle in um, Decker's The Gull's Horn Book. There's a, a chapter on um, the gull, who's the sort of unwitting fool who wants, you know, wannabe, um, wannabe gallant. Um, and it's just kind of like a conduct manual. Uh, and one of the chapters, the little mini chapters is on how to, how to be, in, uh, you know, in Paul's walk. And this tiny detail, which is um, when you're done doing your turns inside the cathedral, if you can read, go to the bookstalls and expound upon your opinions about the books. Um, and I'm actually not getting that exact right. I used to know that. Um, but essentially, he's, the sort of question is like, we have all these shoppers now who are just shopping. They're not, they're not actually buying books to read because some of them actually can't read. Um, but I, that's one of the big points of my um, churchyard chapter is that Paul's, the spatial arrangements of the bookstalls allowed for a new kind of consumerism that moves us beyond purchasing to shopping, what we would call shopping. Um, shopping, and of course, you're you're already kind of pointing in that direction of the advertisements um, that that other folks have talked at length about, um, book historians about how books were advertised, how plays were advertised, um, and of course, there's there's all of the advertisements, um, and people were competing for customers, and some customers were not going to buy; they were just going to browse, and there's a lot of fun literature around. Um, consternation of the browsers. Ben, ben Johnson hated that. He hated having to, to you know, uh, pander to, to the browsers because he didn't think they would understand his books anyway. And so um, the sort of nervousness about what, it is, what does it mean if, if people don't know what they're buying, if they're going just to see, and sometimes they're just going to chat with each other. Um, it just disrupts this understanding of what commercialism had always been understood as you go to the butcher and you buy your piece of meat and then you leave or you go to the tailor and you might have a couple of choices but all of a sudden at Paul's we have this sort of proliferation of choice I feel very I feel that very deeply in our in our current culture where there's just no end of options and that's how I imagine the shoppers must have inhabited that space as you know, the bookstalls, it wasn't a bookshop, like you couldn't go in, it wasn't a massive space, these were crowded, um, both with product and with people, and it couldn't have been a totally pleasant experience, and, you know, likely the booksellers are yelling at you to either get out or buy their books, and mm -hmm. it must have been quite chaotic, and I just love that idea of sort of this, uh, a marketplace, but it's a, a different kind of, um, buying experience um, for the, the purchaser, for the shopper, but also created some deep anxiety on the part of the, the publishers and the booksellers yeah, and the that, authors. That's a, that's a wonderful point. I have not really thought about that, the anxiety 
uh, uh, the uh, and the social anxiety with these uh, young people, uh, and you, we're going to go into your uh, men and vice ridden uh, your edition in just a moment. But uh, I wanted to uh, pick up on two things that you're talking about. Johnson lampoons these people, uh, and I think it's every man out of his humor. They're two, what it's clove and orange, I think. And they are expounding in Paul's walk, and they are mixing up things and making references to the wrong book here and there. And it's totally absurd, and it's totally unreadable for us. You kind of had to be there to, to know who this guy was. Uh, and you're talking about readers, and uh, David Cressy talks about the semi-literate also. But also, you can, if you can read, you can tell your pal or uh, servant or whatever what happened in Romeo and Juliet. You know, there's a lot of uh, oral transmission of what's happening in the books uh, and and that sort of thing. And I, a point that I'm looking at right, right now, and I don't think I'm going to have a lot of success. I'm uh, writing an article on the uh, churchyard is a churchyard. It's a graveyard. And I've been looking into that space, you know, not along with, you know, defecation uh, and uh, pissing alley and uh, whatever, pissing wall, uh, they're dead people, uh, right there, it's, and they're they're not they're not our dead, where we are very tidy in in our times, uh, you know. So uh, there's that. But I do want to move along a little bit here to your work. Uh, I was I have here in my agenda uh, to look at cloth and clothing and that sort of thing. But I want to go first to um, you. You brought it up because you brought it up. Uh, the masculinity and vice. Now, this is uh, an edition that you edited and also uh, wrote the introduction to, but also have looked at very closely the standards for young men. In gender scholarship, I don't see a lot about fashioning male behavior uh, because, it, it, yes, it's a, it's a man's world and women can't own property. Women can't do, you know, uh, decisions on marriage. I just noticed I'm teaching today, I'm teaching uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, who is it? Hermia talks about giving up her patent, her patent to, to a man she doesn't like or want to or whatever. It's a legal term, right? I'm giving up. I, my father's wealth is going to be transferred to the man I marry, never to me. And the only thing I can, the only agency I have in this choice is to, is to marry somebody I love, I want to be with, right? And so women are in that position, of course, but uh, the idea of men uh, always being toxic, <laughs> you know, I kind of like to think of myself, I'm, I'm a guy. Uh, you point out that there, there was a very strong system of of uh, educational uh, system to try to teach men how to behave well. Yes, um, and I will. I will touch upon the previous edited collection, but I, I have really carried that forward. Um, that sense of, as you put it, toxic masculinity. Or as Amanda Bailey, who's my co-editor for that book, and I initially um, thought of the project as men behaving badly. Um, which was a, a sort of a comedy show in the 90s in the UK. It was a show called Men Behaving Badly. And um, I, I'm very interested in transgression, transgressive behavior, specifically on the part of men, um, because that has, we have spilled a lot of ink rightfully on the perception of women as transgressive in the period. And I think there's relatively less on the transgressive um, actions of, of men and the, as you put it, the sort of desire and the movement to constrain or control or educate um, and teach around comportment and what is proper behavior. And I really carry that forward into this book um, where much of what I talk about are actions or activities or behavior that's out of place. And I'm putting that in quotes. It's Tim Cresswell's phrase. Um, it's, he's a cultural geographer and he has a book called In Place, Out of Place, mm -hmm. specifically looking at how um, our relationship to space is almost always defined um, with uh, human behavior and often by human behavior that um, acts 
um, against or out of step with the expectations of how you're supposed to act in certain places. And so um, the Masculinity and the Metropolis of Vice book, um, our authors really explored that through subjects such as gambling and alcohol consumption, drinking games, how you know, sort of stage properties were managed. Um, there's some really cool authors, I mean, really cool subjects um, that the authors are dealing with. And um, I've kind of carried that forward. I didn't realize that um, at the time as I was writing the St. Paul's book, but when I wrote the conclusion, I realized like, I'm just writing about men behaving badly again. Mm -hmm. um, we have not only the sort of misuse of the interior space with the loiterers and the newsmongers. Um, and Thomas, I do talk a little bit about the monuments and the, and the graves inside the cathedral proper um, and how those graves were potentially misused. Um, but also when we take a step out, even the choir boys, right? The choir boys who have very specific job to do, which is to sing during even song and matins and song service were doing crazy things like running out into the nave and collecting what's called spur money. They would charge anyone wearing spurs because um, it was against the rules and they would get money from them and pocket it. And um, so there's all sorts of, you know, upset uh, church officials saying that we got to stop the kids from doing this. They're leaving in the middle of the service. Um, we have an amazing detail of, of the boys um, urinating on the cathedral floor and sliding uh, as if it was ice is the phrase. Um, and general, generally speaking, boys were, you know, boys then and now are gross and <laughs> do really yucky things. And there's a lot of um, trying to control the young boys, both the boys in the choir, but also the boys who were pupils at St. Paul's um, Grammar School, um, kind of controlling their days and controlling their behavior. So it starts at quite a young age. Um, and then when we move into, as I mentioned before, the vicars, the, cor the, cho the choristers, um, there's uh, all sorts of cens cens censures put on them because they are behaving quite badly. Um, and they're mismanaging um, everything, but they're misusing the space primarily. And ultimately what Amanda Bailey and I tried to do in that book was link um, mass, the definition of masculinity was tied quite closely to the way that men moved through and embodied, moved through space and embodied that space. And so um, it was, uh, touching upon cultural geography that I really ended up kind of picking up that strain and, and moving forward with that. So um, yeah. uh, the creation of London through the way that men in particular um, moved through that space. is, is yeah. uh, Well, I wanted to supplement what you're saying here with the title of the books. There'll be a cover shown here on the uh, video version, uh, Masculinity and the Metropolis of Vice, 1550, 1650. And yes, Amanda Bailey and Rose Henschel. Uh, so that was 2010, but it's uh, the sections that I've read uh, just uh, resound right now. It's, it's, it's all, it's, nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed. In fact, it, it might have in recent years gotten worse in terms of public behavior of people we've seen. Uh, of course, you're American. I am too. And this is an international broadcast, but uh, there's some very ugly scenes recently in America of people behaving badly that uh, you would think, uh, and th there have been uh, good moments recently uh, where, you know, in, in any kind of argument, dispute over politics and so forth, uh, a, a way of doing, a way of approaching people uh, with whom you do not agree, that might be more genteel, more uh, civilized, uh, more in the area, uh, you know, in the area of uh, civilized public debate. <laughs> Now, Shakespeare, I wanted to make this point, too, because Shakespeare, uh, it almost as a rule, avoided the city. It's just, it's, I've looked and looked and looked, and, every, and a lot of people have, uh, and it's, it's come out in a lot of scholars, you know, Shakespeare was not a city playwright, whereas Johnson and uh, Marston, and, uh, you know, there's a list, a whole list of uh, people who love the city and love to make fun of the city, and I think some it wound up in a, a jail <laughs> because they were a little too city-oriented, and I think Shakespeare uh, avoided jail, and 
primarily because he stayed away, but you look just under the surface and you can see all these behaviors with that you're you're talking about in the cathedral precinct and also in terms of masculine, you know, bad behavior with, with men. The big one that came up earlier in my mind was Ophelia uh, admonishing politely her brother who's preaching to her, you know, and, and saying and talking about the preachers who wreck not their read, who do not practice what they preach. And you were talking about the section of uh, the uh, northeast side the, of the cathedral where uh, you had those uh, people who were churchmen not practicing what they were preaching. That's right. right? That's right. Uh, I will mention the one time St. Paul's Cathedral shows up in Shakespeare is in um, Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Falstaff is um, trying to find Bardolf, his servant, and he's asking the page where he is, um, and he sort of reflects. He said, "Well, I bought I bought him in Paul's." Yeah, yeah. Um, That's where you go get a man. And, and exactly. Paul, and you you bring up and, and you know much more about it than I do. The, is it the sequi the sequi door the yeah. area of where yeah. advertisements were were placed, and that's, right. that's that's where you you went if you needed a man and somebody that's to help right. you do something. You could put up a notice like uh, uh, the classifieds. Uh, yeah. I have noticed one other area, but it's out of time. Richard uh, the third. The, I think there's a little pageant where they go. The Pauls is very briefly mentioned. It has nothing to do with anything. It's in <laughs> fact one of the last places you would go if you were trying to make connections uh, yeah. between uh, 16th century and 17th century uh, Shakespearean period. There are many other uh, things, and yeah. uh, you know, I'll just throw it out. Gallants at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Uh, or wannabe gallants that you mentioned earlier, uh, getting into a fight in a public space, um, Mercutio acting out, doing the Queen Mab speech. Where is he? Zeffirelli gets it right, I think. He's in an mm -hmm. echo, you know, he's in, he's surrounded by stone and he's in this echoing area where his voice is being amplified and he has an audience and he does this impromptu crazy speech, right? I just think that is drawn, where else could it be drawn from in London? you know, right. moments like that. Right. And um, Hamlet, of course, Hamlet's um, diatribe against the boy companies, um, yes. the, the little AZs um, who, you know, are stealing the thunder of the adult playing companies. Um, that is clearly a reference to the children of Paul's and Blackfriars, um, yeah. the, Queen's, the Queen's children. And um, there, so yeah, you have, with Shakespeare, I, I did look at my um, index before this interview to remind myself what I had said about Shakespeare in the book. And I, I, there's a handful, right? And so, um, and it's usually, as you said, just more of like a, an analog, right? Rather than a direct reference. The Bardolph comment is funny because that's a, that's a gag for the audience. The audience, it, it goes on to say, after I bought Bardolph in uh, Paul's, if I had bought a horse in Smithfield and married, you know, found a wife in the stews, I would be horse manned and wived. And the idea there is that you get what you pay for, right? Yeah. If you go to Smithfield, you're going to get a bad horse. And I, and I, you know, I found that through research of people who work on, um, on animals. Oh, um, really? And of course you don't want to go to the whorehouses to get your a wife. And then the, you know, analog there is that um, maybe Paul's is not such a great place to to uh, hire your servant, um, which that's, you know, that's a one piece of evidence we have that maybe it's like, you know, there's not not great uh, options for for buying people. Not great, not a great option. Uh, you know, you, you're likely to pick up a thief, uh, yeah. according okay. to and of course, all the false staff in his group are, are no better. But the uh, what big point I wanted to make about your book and in collaboration with the uh, virtual St. Paul's is that this, I believe, is a starting point uh, or can be marked as a juncture where so much more research can be done now because you can point to your work uh, if you are in a, any variety of fields. Uh, and uh, also be, supplement that. Oh, and by the way, I'm giving a, I'm doing a paper for the Shakespeare Society of Japan in two days, three days, two, two, two days. I'm one day ahead of you. I'm your Wednesday, my Thursday. But uh, I'm doing, and you have saved me 
because I didn't know that the full cathedral, I have a slide that has the old truncated version. And so now I can fix that and be up to up to date. But it, it's a, this is the point I'm making is that we can now show it. And so I've been showing truncated versions and talks about Shakespeare, in this case, an edition that appeared in uh, Paul's Cross Church Churchyard. And I wanted the audience to get the visual, right? Because it's very hard, but then again, the visual can't uh, lead you into the details of how, uh, in what you can do in print, both collaborate so well. And uh, so we, I, we owe you great thanks because we can, uh, we can uh, go to this book now and uh, and also to the to the project. Well, let's talk about clothing and cloth because that was your earlier uh, work right out of uh, graduate school, I believe. Uh, the culture of cloth in early modern England, textual constructions of a national identity. Now, those are some big words. Well, thank you. Um, it is like going back in a time capsule um, to look at that book again. It was, um, it came out of my, um, graduate dissertation at University of California, Santa Barbara. And I, um, again, worked on it for several more years and added another chapter to, I did a full rehaul, overhaul of that book, um, but but the kernel was there. And, and um, I was reflecting today on the relationship, or I guess the thread, the, the threads that have stayed with me from that book. Um, and I think one of the, the funnier ones is that I, I, I uh, seem to be unafraid of taking these like monolithic subjects, like the British wool industry, like maybe there's no other subject that has been written about more by historians. Um, and St. Paul's Cathedral, again, very, very um, well trod ground. And deciding that that was okay and I wasn't going to be afraid um, of the historians. <laughs> and so in, in that particular book, I make the claim that especially by looking at the, again, popular literature, prose, drama, um, satire, uh, even pastoral literature in that book because of the, the sheep and the wool connection, that we're able to understand the anxiety that was happening in the late 16th century around the crisis of the economy, um, founded largely on what was happening in the wool industry and the decline of the wool industry as the central uh, commodity. Um, uh, we could better understand all of that through looking at literary and sort of more cultural texts. And, and that's ultimately that thread has stayed with me is, um, the thread. Nuancing what we exactly <laughs> nuancing what we know um, about something that we think we know a lot about by looking at different sources. Um, and just to pick up on uh, the thread of threads, um, I end the St. Paul's book by talking about the study of St. Paul's as a, a tapestry, um, that we have these threads, hundreds and hundreds of threads that sometimes interweave and make sense for us of a picture, but then there's always something beyond the tapestry, right? It's pointing to like beyond the border of the tapestry is something that's just out of our reach, just out of our sight. Um, and I know you're nodding because you totally get that. And when you work on this, something as complex and <clears throat> complex and wonderful and complicated as St. Paul's, you have to be comfortable with that kind of work. And I think that um, while my, my work on the cloth industry focused on um, how this, this literature helped create a national discourse around the cloth industry. Um, it, it again was talking about a moment in crisis for the industry and, and how um, writers, literary writers and other writers were navigating this sort of crisis. And I think that's what's happening with Paul's. Paul's is a you know, it's a Norman cathedral that has had to endure the Reformation and all of the whiplash of the Reformation and is in terrible, terrible shape, which I think, Thomas, when you and I initially met, I was giving a paper on the, the fabric of the cathedral and the yes. terrible um, dilapidated condition it had yes. fallen into. And how yeah. do we, who does this cathedral belong to? Who does, who's going to pay for it? Why do we care? Th yes. Those are um, questions that I think are, are um, not only answered, but we can assist in arriving at answers through looking at literature and yeah. lit more literary inflected texts yeah. with the full knowledge 
that many of our historical texts, if you gave them to someone on the street, they would say, well, this is a poem. Like this, you, this supposedly like legitimate historical text is actually written in verse. Now that's a poem as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's no easy, um, you know, there's no, the lines between what is literature is very blurry in this time period. And, and I think that, that makes for, um, for historians can be confusing because they don't know how to approach a horrible poem like we do. <laughs> um, these poems are not good, but you got to figure out how to read them and what you're getting out of them. And so I think that literary scholars really do bring um, a, a methodology and a sensibility to this, these tricky sources. Yeah, they do. And I, I was just thinking, just as they had their spaces, particularly in the cathedral, we have created ours uh, academically. And by uh, and we're moving in. I'm segueing into your work as an administrator, and uh, you you have an overview now that I've never had uh, as a you're an associate dean. Is that correct? And so you are in charge of scheduling all of these classes. You have this at what I probably a tsunami of of small projects you have to do. And let's just face it. I'm certain there's some uh, personnel there. There are people, you're dealing with people. So not it's hard to make everybody happy all the time. And uh, so uh, you can see how we have created sometimes in, in much too rigid, the word in Japanese is katai, uh, hard. You know, we have these, well, don't step into my area. You know, mm -hmm. uh, don't even look over the fence into my backyard. Uh, and some people are that protective. The people you and I, and we were talking about that earlier conference in, uh, uh, at McGill in Montreal, I think it was 2012, the St. Paul's Cross that uh, Torrance Kirby hosted. Wow, did I feel those, those walls just disappear? You know, you have these guys like uh, uh, Stan Hope there, you know, is the gentleman, John King, uh, and who unfortunately passed away recently. And, uh, uh, and all the others, I, I'm, I'm leaving out names that I should include, uh, my, my, uh, my dear friend, Susan Wabuda, and uh, the, all of these people who were just coming in from all areas and so supportive of each other. And that could be, that could be the, the, uh, a goal. And as an administrator, do you see a possibility of creating that kind of uh, communal exchange uh, between departments? Oh, that's an amazing question. Um, I was terrified at that conference because I knew there, that there were people there that were in schools of divinity coming. There were faculty from schools of divinity. And I felt like as a literary scholar, uh, pretty ill-equipped to be having any sort of theological debates. Um, I was quite terrified. And, and Peter McCullough was also there. Yes. The, um, a Dunn scholar and also a sermon scholar. Um, mm -hmm. And I was also, you know, but anyway, of course, but you, you described it perfectly because we were all forced to be in one room. There were no concurrent sessions. We forced is a bad word. We were all invited to be in one room together for every single talk. And we didn't get to pop out or, you know, go to a different panel. Um, and, and I think that is, helping me get towards the answer to your question, which is that getting people in a room who are coming from hopefully the same, a, a problem or um, an issue from really different perspectives. And I think that St. Paul's Conference is a great example. We were all talking about sermons at Paul's Cross but we were coming at it from different perspectives. We had John Schofield, the archeologist there. We had John Wall there who was just getting started on his virtual project. And everyone was like, what is this? Yeah. Um, and that is the way I approach my work as an administrator. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs. I'm in the College of Liberal Arts. We have 13 departments and 19 undergraduate programs. And I'm supposed to oversee all the academic curriculum and and you know pro, you know the I you know I, I, I get to help departments do what they want to do um, but when we have to get, make headway on a problem the best solution and this was very difficult during the pandemic to get people in a room and sometimes it's a virtual room now mm -hmm. and really I, I my job is to define the problem and really let 
the faculty who are experts in their own field bring their expertise and and uh, you know and and help us think through things. Um, and yeah, there's problems with like making sure that people don't talk too much or too loudly or you know aren't insulting each other. But I do think that that's sort of a, a good approach to the way that I think of my um, administrative work is. Um, how do we advance something? How do we move something forward when we have to uh, honor the the various disciplines that we come from and um, not diminish or belittle, but really honor those perspectives um, so that we're all learning more. I'm in a college with economics and ceramics, right? This is not an easy thing. Um, but we really, it's, it's the only way forward at a, especially at a complex, like a large university is to land on, on some page. And I also, the other thing that I, I, my mantra is um, consensus, not unanimity. <laughs> yeah. We don't all have yeah. to come to the same conclusion, but yeah. you know, if, if there's some sense that we're on the right track, that yeah. feels pretty good. Yeah. That's the Japanese way, by the way. Yeah reaching consensus just that's that's the best you can do is to try to 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 forge as best you can a consensus because not everyone will ever agree mm -hmm. uh but i i don't uh, well we we need to it's a very often talked about uh subject but juggling work and you're juggling not only work but two works you you uh, have completed recently a mono a, a, a book on a monolithic topic while being uh uh, in administration and doing what you were talking about, while also being a mother of two uh, teenage or almost teenage uh, children, uh, I've, I've already gone through this. Uh, some, in some ways, teenage is better. Everybody says it's a horrible time, but they, you, your kids are fairly independent. But five years ago, they were much younger, and so you're you're having to do the mother thing. And I read in one of your interviews that you're a runner. Are you still running? No, or? I'm an, I'm a former injured runner. Ah, me too. <laughs> me too. Uh, and I, we, <laughs> we could cover a lot of, but uh, I had to go to uh, walking. Uh, I'm, yes, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, ambulatory now, just like yes. it. Paul, and, uh, but love it. And uh, so uh, you said that though exercise did help you clarify your daily duties, how to, to manage to take that time. And uh, you're in Colorado. We, you know, those of us outside, you tend to see Colorado as this kind of healthy place, you know, nice air, uh, lots of beautiful scenery and a lot of things to look at naturally. Uh, and uh, so is that still the case? Do you still? Uh, depend, yes, you know? I definitely try to get outside as much as possible. Um, I work on problems while I'm walking. Um, and, you know, I, my, you know, my juggle is not unusual. There are a lot of people out there doing the juggle. And I, I talk about in my acknowledgments to the St. Paul's book that my, um, my daughter was um, not even two years old when I started research on this book. And I um, was invited to um, come see the, the library at the current St. Paul's. Um, and Joseph Wisdom, who's the librarian of St. Paul's, allowed um, me and my uh, family to come in. And I remember carrying her. Actually, I didn't carry her because I I'm, I'm also have a fear of ledges. Um, but my husband carried my daughter up the dean's staircase. And, um, <laughs> and it was just such a strange thing to be doing um, with this tiny child. And so she really doesn't remember a time before I was working on this book. And my um, son, who is now 11, um, was born when I was in the early stages of writing the book. And so um, the, my secret, and it is no secret, is, is uh, habit, <laughs> consistency, and um, embracing the early morning hours, which I know you do too, Thomas. I wake up, I still do, I wake up early morning, the house is quiet. Um, I, I, I may not get a lot done, but I, if I can do a half hour every day that I don't have to like, if, if I only work once a week, I spend the first half hour of the next session figuring out where I left off. But when I work, you know, just a little bit every day, um, uh, it's, and that, that running really helps me with that. Running long distances is like, you cannot run a marathon or a half marathon by walking out the door and doing it, you have to put in that those yeah. little those little runs, and so that's um, you know 
finishing the book. I also have, a, you know, a great friend who works in um, an adjacent period. She works on Mexico, but in the same time period and cares about things like sacred space and all of that. And so just having a, um, an interlocutor that is, uh, you know, will help you talk through ideas has been really important to me. But yeah, some days I do, just to be honest, I do feel like I don't even understand how that got written. Um, it, it does, yeah. it did feel, especially when I took on that administrative role that it was like a, an against all odds yeah. <laughs> situation. Yeah. yeah, well, you did it. You did it. Uh, well, and you brought up something that's interesting. You, your friend works on 16th and 17th century Mexico. Is, is that what? Yeah. And there's a Mexican connection in your uh, in your line. It's, am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. Also, yes, she works on um, she's an art historian. So she works on Aztec and post-Columbian post yeah. right. um, yeah. codices. Um, yes, I'm, I'm actually a Mexican myself. My uh, mother is Mexican, was born in, in the United States, but um, both of her parents um, are Mexican from the state of Sonora. And I grew up in Southern California. Um, my grandfather was the um, Mexican consul to the United States, and he was very into Mexican culture um, growing up. That was really important. Um, to our family, still is. Um, and my mother now moves, lived, uh, lives in Fort Collins and moved here. Um, so I've got um, a little abuelita, which is little grandmother for my kids now in town. And I say little is because the sort of joke about Mexican grandmothers is they just keep shrinking <laughs> until they disappear. And in my family, they grow very old. And so I look forward to a long, a long, a lot more years with my now 85 year old um, Mexican mama. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. That's a wonderful connection. You seem to have a, and have inherited an administrative gene from your grandfather uh, there. So perhaps if there's such a thing. Yes. Yeah, so you grew up in California and you were, though, you were uh, undergraduate at Vassar, I saw. And uh, so you moved to the Northeast a long way from home as a young person and then went back to it's sort of an uh, east-west thing. You went back to Santa Barbara and uh, ending up in Colorado with that connection. Oh, what a wonderful uh, thing. Um, I sort of, uh, in, in my career, the, hub, the hubcaps sort of came off. I ended up in Japan, uh, but, uh, uh, but I'm glad I did. I'm really happy that I did. If you have in mind, if you've gone to London <clears throat> or if you've seen pictures of current St. Paul's, and I think there's a picture of it right behind my head, it doesn't uh, look like that in the 16th century. It doesn't look anything like that as Christopher Wren's later re rendering of the cathedral, beautifully done, of course, but the cathedral you're talking about is a Gothic, like you said, Norman cathedral that, <clears throat> uh, second point is that you don't finish a cathedral. A cathedral is always in growth, and, and St. Paul's is no exception, although there's this one juncture where Wren comes in and just changes everything. But uh, I was before, pre-pandemic, there's a Barcelona connection. Uh, it, I'm married to, um, uh, well, I have a sort of Spanish family now in an uh, old age uh, what my wife calls old person's marriage, but uh, we were both married before uh, with children. But uh, so I've gotten to spend a lot of time in Barcelona, and of course, the Sagrada Familia. Uh, people will say, well, when are they going to finish it? When are they going to? And, and the answer is never. Yeah. The cathedral, as soon as they finish whatever, um, you know, design, they'll have to go back and start working on other areas. I love that you brought that up because I did forget to mention that one of the sort of major sort of theoretical um, underpinnings of, of the St. Paul's book is that um, we can really only make sense of space if we understand it to be dynamic and not and, and, and in flux. And, and other cultural geographers work on this. Uh, um, Alan Pred in particular talks about space as a process. And um, it's such a useful way to think about cathedrals for the very reasons that you said. They're always in, in flux. I talk a lot about that as about the you know the changes that were made to the fabric, um, to the pulpit, to the you know houses were built against the cathedral. Then they were taken down. 
Um, and things that seem like they're there forever, um, they're not. Um, they get destroyed. Um, I talk about the fire in 1561. Yeah. It's sort of the place where my book starts. Yeah. And I talk about the Notre Dame fire at the end of my conclusion. Um, I yeah. was literally watching the footage of Notre Dame burning as I was finishing the last chapter of my book on, on the fabric of the cathedral. And I was like, I, I had this weird reaction. I had a very different reaction than most people, which was like, you know, tears and sorrow. I was like, ah, this fires happen in cathedrals. Yeah. And by the way, that fire that burnt down was Victorian. It wasn't medieval. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. so I, my, my response to it was very weird because I, I was more detached, I, I would say. Um, yes, of course, it was a horrible thing that it burned down, but, um, but there's very little in our lives um, in terms of the built environment that is permanent. And when you have something um, like a cathedral, it seems, as you said, monolithic, it seems permanent because of, you know, everything. But, you know, even that cathedral was not impervious to the Great Fire of London. And no. Um, no. what is the, the Sonnet 55? What does Shakespeare say? Um, the something or the tombs of monuments can outlive this powerful rhyme. And this idea is, is like, that tombs and monuments are actually permanent, but you know, Shakespeare lived in London. He knew, he knew that space was in flux all the time. So I don't know if he was making a sly joke about that, but um, I, I really appreciate this idea that like nothing really, especially cathedrals is permanent because they're susceptible to age, just like all of us, but they're also susceptible to ideology and abuse <laughs> and trash. <laughs> and I think that um, uh, it's just really important that we demystify what a cathedral is. Yeah, and bombs, and bombs. And bombs, and bombs, exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm in uh, Tokyo now, and you know whatever uh, was here before uh, World War II that remains is all, you know, very special. The spaces change. But I think in th this cathedral, that we've gotten a, a lot of it because you have your, your work on cloth, the work on mass, the uh, toxic, well, the you know bad behavior, and that sort of thing. I, th I think that we've kind of gotten uh, Rose, uh, a good picture of Rose here, and I'm I'm hoping maybe we can do this again at some point. But this is where we go to future. I hope you don't have anything in the future. I mean, come on, you just you just published a book. Yes. Um, I, um, that is a good question. I would, I can point you to future work that I would like to have someone else do on St. Paul's. Um, uh, it is something I talk about in the conclusion. So if that will entice you to, uh, if you're casting about for a research project out there, I have some ideas for you. Um, I did toy with the idea of doing a very short thing on um, the immediate a uh, year after the great fire, mm -hmm. um, what was happening at the cathedral because it, my understanding, my wrong understanding was that everything truly burnt to the ground and there was nothing left. Yeah. And, and, you know, then I was reading a letter from Christopher Wren um, talking about what the next steps were in terms of recovering from this horrible catastrophe and he signed it you know from the deanery at St. Paul's so he was actually he had set up his office ah very good very good all right is that uh it's um 66 16 is that the yes fire? yes the 1666 okay. is yeah. the and I think this letter that I was I happened upon was actually a um from 1667 or maybe even later 1666 Great. is very soon after Fabulous. and there's um, several poems written about the fire and I just thought well that would be kind of fun just to do a, a little thing on the poems yeah. and um, yeah. because they refer to what's left and then I started to go down all the rabbit holes and I thought, I can't do this. Um, can't do this. Um, oh, so it's just so, and, and you were there, you see in Japan, uh, sometimes we are, uh, it's gotten much better with the digital, you know, kind of revolution the past couple of decades, but uh, sometimes we're just not there and you have a very fine library where you are. And if it's not in your library, you can get it very quickly. And in Tokyo, it's not quite as easy, but I did want to give a, a bit of this, what, basically from what they call the Henrican Reformation, but basically 
from the point at which the uh, the crown really was not supporting the church in Rome, which is mid fifth uh, six, uh, yeah. <laughs> mid fifteen hundreds. I told you yeah. before we the mid fifteen hundreds. So we're over a century of a cathedral that was not really did not get backing so much from the crown, except the short period during the Marian period where they weren't able to do that much. And then it's just going into decay over these years. And that space is transforming during that time. And in my view, there are a lot of flowers blooming in there too. Beautiful things, you know, uh, the dramas, the poetry, the, the things that, that, that drew us into this business, right? When we were uh, very young, you know, I was, I, I almost say in every podcast, I was supposed to be selling insurance somewhere. You know, I, I was supposed to be the guy who was good with people. And I learned later that, that doesn't help you much in business. <laughs> you know, sometimes being bad with people is, is better, but I, everybody it kind of marked me for business. And I just, you know, this is transformation that we all went through. And I'm sure that you went through the same sort of thing. You know, I'm marked for another path, but then we get captured by it. Yeah. We walk, well, we, um, Thomas, you, it's like I planted this, but I am working on something. Um, I'm co-editing a new book. It is not in early modern literature or culture or St. Paul's or anything like that. Um, and it is called Transformations. Um, Transformations, it is a um, edited collection with a colleague at Georgia Gwinnett College in Georgia. Um, and um, it is about humanities scholars who either by uh, will or happenstance have moved into or are thinking of moving into administrative positions uh -huh. and how we navigate that when we mm -hmm. still want to keep our foot in our scholarship and our teaching um, and um, how we can call on our humanities training to help us be excellent administrators mm -hmm. and uh, that whether that's communication skills or writing or um, people, right? Mm -hmm. um, the w the work we do in the humanities really has, you know, has helped me in my role. Um, but that is the the next big project. Um, we we've got a complete draft. We're shopping it around to a press, and so that'll be my um, maybe my last thing I ever publish. <laughs> it, it will not. It will not. You will not be able to stop the machine. Uh, it will keep on churning as long as you live, and and that will be many many more years. And uh, so the. Uh, I, I'm so happy to hear that you're stepping out of field because that's a good thing to do, you know, and it's a learning, uh, there's a learning curve when you thought, when you start thinking about your audience, not being the people we mentioned earlier at uh, a conference, uh, our, uh, in our roughly speaking in our interdisciplinary area, um, to a, a, a larger, a broader audience. And, uh, I've tried it and done it. I've done it, um, uh, then it's uh, it's difficult to get people to read it, but I think because it's instructional, you know, those were the first great books, really. You could argue that the Bible is an instructional text. Yeah. So there's uh, there's war, there's romance, you know, all of those things. <laughs> but uh, instructional, I think some of the big sellers during that period were instructional text. And yeah. and your your work on St. Paul's, I'll finish with this. And please stay after we finish the. Uh, uh, interview. I want to debrief a little bit with you, but uh, your work has done, uh, like I said, I want to emphasize this. Uh, I will be using your name this weekend because here, go see, go see Rose and what she says, right? I can throw it out. And I have an article that may be published where I, I already have done it. I've sent it out. We'll see how, how kind the readers are uh, to my idea. But uh, there was so much, you know, you only have so much space and that you can, now we can go to Rose and, and, and we can go to uh, the St. Paul's, uh, John Wall's uh, project. And that's, that saves us and then we can focus on something else uh, to what we wanted, that little part. And that's what I'm seeing as the future of your book being a very seminal to a lot oh. of new scholarship. That's what I'm oh. hoping. Well, that is very, very kind. I do want to give a plug to a new book that's just come out with Paul Grave. It's called Old St. Paul's and Culture. 
It's edited okay. by two young scholars, Shannon Altman and Jonathan Buckner. They're two okay. scholars that work in London. And um, it is, it's an edited collection and it moves from the medieval St. Erkenwald up through the, um, the uh, book stalls in the 17th century and the book booksellers. And so um, it's really taking up the mantle of taking seriously cultural production in and around Paul's. And I am a co-editor on the introduction. I was very pleased to be brought into that project and I'm really excited to see that project come out because that's exactly what I hope will happen is um, my book is just a jumping off point um, and hopefully we'll just see other young scholars um, and, and maybe not so young scholars find something in there that I couldn't cover or I couldn't or I didn't get right and and figure out how to how to answer the questions fine. that that we've left open. Fine, fine. We we all know the name of Cleon Brooks, and uh, <laughs> probably uh, for ninety percent of the reason is people are talking about how Cleon Brooks was wrong, right? Yeah. But uh, I've forgotten them, but I remember <laughs> Cleon Brooks uh, for some reason. Rose, I, I I know I'm speaking for our audience, whether they're joining joining us by podcast or on YouTube. I know I'm speaking for, for them. Also, my uh, colleagues here in Japan with the Shakespeare Society of Japan, some absolutely fabulous people. Uh, I wish I could just name, it would take too long, but I wish I could name the wonderful people. They're going to be so, so happy to be able to meet you, at least in this capacity over Zoom. And uh, we just can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure and an honor to be with you and to um, have your listeners and viewers uh, uh, get to hear a little bit about this. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.